you know, at least he was away for that weekend. And it's good to be back here with you again. All right. I'm just getting myself organized. The sermon for today is going to be being, be conformed to his image. Last time I was before you in February, I believe, uh, we talked about being ambassadors for Christ. Yes. You, you, I took her bottle, so give it to her. Thank you. We were talking about being ambassadors for Christ. And we talked about as an ambassador for Christ, there are things that we need to be aware of as ambassadors. And some of the things we talked about the last time was as an ambassador for Christ, we have no personal agenda. Since we don't have a personal agenda because the ambassador represents their country or represents another authority. And since our citizenship is in heaven, we are uh, soldiers of the cross, we are children of God, we are, we are representing Christ here in the earth. So first of all, as we represent Christ, we first, we don't have our own personal agenda. We also talked about the last time that since I don't have a personal agenda as a child of God, I should be promoting God's agenda. What does God desire here in the earth? How should God be glorified in my day-to-day -day living? So that should be my priority agenda, even though, of course, I have it balanced with my life's responsibility of being a husband, wife, chill, uh, taking care of the affairs of this life. Another thing we learned uh, uh, was that we have faith in God's presence being with us as ambassadors, as we carry out God's assignment in our sphere of influence. We know that his presence is with us. He told us he will be with us even to the very end of the age. And then one of the last thing we talked about was we do not take rejection personally as we share the love of God, as we live out the love of God, maybe not even verbally, but as we live it out, there, are, there will be those that you will encounter that will reject your lifestyle, will reject your purpose in serving God. And yet we have to learn not to take these things personally. That's what we talked about the last time I was here. This time, just to add on to that, since we are now ambassadors for the Lord, those of us that have placed our trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and now we understand our purpose, we have a new purpose. Prior to us becoming a Christian, our purpose was to serve our selfishness. Whatever we wanted to do, however we wanted to do it. Some of us demonstrated selfishness in a very destructive way. Some of us demonstrated selfishness in a self-righteous way. We had, a, we had a legalistic way of living and we thought we were better than others. So both extremes is wrong. Oh, not pleasing in the sight of God. Living a life like the younger prodigal son in, in a wastefulness, you know, that's not pleasing to God. Or being the elder brother in that parable of having a self-righteous that, you know, that God owed me because, Lord, I live, I live for you. Lord, I've been here all along. Lord, I wasn't like someone else. Both attitudes are wrong in the eyes of God. Uh, both are sin in his sight. And so we have been brought out of that somewhere on that spectrum. And now we are learning as ambassadors. We are learning as disciples. We are learning as Christians how to live with a dependency upon God and to live a life that is pleasing to him. We are learning to fight the good fight of faith. We are learning to turn away from idols that try to get us from day to day. Idols that pop up even on your phone. You, 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 you're looking at one thing and then a crazy ad will come up to get you and me distracted. There's so many things here that is trying to distract us and to try to have, have us to focus on the things of this world. We ought to love not the world, nor the things of this world. And we know that in this world there are at least three major forces from the enemy. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So as a child of God, we are fully aware that though we are in this world, we are not of this world. And we are learning to be conformed to this image. Why am I a Christian? Why am I serving God? Why am I going, why am I on this journey? A lot of times, first of all, a lot of times being selfish, we're on this journey because we don't want to go to hell. We don't want to experience eternal damnation in any of its ugly form. But yet even beyond that, why am I on this journey? We are learning that we are on this journey to glorify God. 
we are learning that we are on this journey that it is all about him and not about us. And it is a constant battle that many of us face subtly and overtly, uh, you know, things trying to distract us from the things of God. And so today, uh, as, as ambassadors, I want to stay on that theme, but yet we go into another uh, phase of, of walking with the Lord, being conformed to his image. You see an image of a, 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 a hands molding a clay, a molding a pottery. And this, is, and this is our Christian life. After we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are babes in the Lord. We are growing into maturity day by day, year by year, century by century. We are being shaped to be more and more like Christ in our attitudes, in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. And we have to learn to be like this, this clay. We have to learn to let God mold and shape us. Many times when God is molding and shaping us, we are resistant. Lord, we don't, I don't want to do this. Lord, I don't want to be honest. Lord, I don't want to forgive this person. You know, there are many things here in life that God is using to help shape us to be more like Christ. That's why it's so important for us to recapture what is our purpose here in the earth. Our purpose here is to glorify God in thought, word, and deed. And how do we do this? They were, you know, by obeying his word and by, and by trusting in him. But yet, we are learning to do these things. One songwriter says, I learned to trust in Jesus. I think it's Andre Cross. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it, through it all, I learned to take hold of his word. So understand that this is a journey while we're living in this broken and fallen world of being conformed to the image of Christ. But yet our goal is, I'm a child of God. I'm an ambassador of God. I'm here to represent God's agenda. I'm not here to vote for this, this party or that party or that agenda or that agenda. I'm here to promote God's agenda, first of all. And God gave his people many things about what is the kingdom of God is like, how we should conduct ourselves as kingdom citizens. He starts off by giving us the Sermon on the Mount and all these um, principles and precepts based on the Sermon on the Mount. And then he gives other precepts all throughout scriptures. He said, if you want to be Lord, if, if you want to be a leader, you must be a servant. You must be, uh, you must be childlike faith. You must have a childlike faith. There are many things that are counterculture to this Western U.S. culture that the word of God specifically lines out for us to live. And yet sometimes it is oppressed just to do it. It is oppressed to, to be obedient. It is oppressed to do what is right in the sight of God. But it's worth doing what is right in the sight of God. And we are learning that we are being conformed to his image. Following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is a transformative spiritual journey that is shaped by scripture and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We live in a broken and fallen world with all this pain, suffering, confusion, and distraction of idols, tempting us to not to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, tempting us not to love Christ or to make disciples of all nations. The Apostle Paul shared this insight from Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. He, he says this, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who has been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predetermined, or he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be, Christ might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father, open up our eyes that we may see wondrous things from your word. Lord, give us all an ear to hear, a heart to receive, and a spirit to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you love God? Are you called according to his purpose? Is God shaping or conforming you in the image of Jesus Christ? Like a potter molds clay pottery for his purposes. In what ways 
do we conform to the image of Christ? I've listed here at least four areas of our lives that we must learn as we progress on this journey that God wants us to conform to the image of Christ. And briefly, we will cover these. Each of these areas can be an hour long teaching in, in and of itself. But this morning, it'll just be a brief overview. The four areas that I listed here, they all start with the letter M, that the Lord uh, wants us to be conformed in the image of Christ in, in at least these four ways. You may come up with others. In our mind, we must learn to have a dependence upon God and his provision. In our mannerism, the way we conduct ourselves, we must learn to have faithful obedience to God. We must learn to have a level of servitude that brings glory to God. In our methods of spiritual discipline, a lot of times we overlook the point that in order to be a disciple of Christ, we must live a disciplined life. How else can the fruitfulness of God be evident unless we partner with God and do our part. God tells us what to do, but yet we have to do our part so that the fruit of Christ can grow over time and be displayed to all. And then last but not least, what is our mission? And our mission is to make disciples. First thing we wanna look at briefly is having a transformed mind reflecting on Christ's humility. What is one of the major characteristics of Christ? He was humble. He had a, he had a humility that goes far beyond what uh, human comprehension. Church historian Bruce Shelley says this, Christianity is the only major religion to have as a central event the humiliation of its God. In this context, humiliation is the willingness of God to give up aspects of his divine privileges to reconcile lost humanity to himself. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, creator of heaven and earth, submitted to the humiliation of dying on a cross at the hands of his creation. As a once for all permanent sin offering, for the sins of humanity. Humility is a deep dependence on God in all circumstances and situations. I'll let you think about that definition here or characteristic. Humility is a deep dependence on God in all circumstances and situations. And of course, Jesus being our ultimate uh, savior and leader and rabbi and master gave us a demonstration in his own life what humility looks like at a very deep level. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, th 3 through 8 it's not, it will not be on the screen so I'll read it if you don't have it in front of you. Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 to 8 Paul is writing to the church of Philippi and he says this Philippians 2 Verses 3 to 8. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. Verse 5. Have this mind. What mind? The mind of looking or taking a look on the interests of others, have this mind among yourselves, it should be part of the body of Christ, not just us individually, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, where? In Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, or humiliated himself, or he took down a, a social notch in, a, in his standing, by, by doing what? By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself even more by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see this level of humility. Here he is, the God of the universe. God had the same glory. Christ had the same glory with the Father in the beginning. 
because you remember in John 17, the Lord said, give me back the glory that I had with you from the beginning. And here he is, he took on the form of man. He gave up certain aspects of divine privileges and humbled himself, took a lower status to become a man. And then after Christ became a man, he took even a lower standard and allowed his creation to kill him on the cross, to crucify him on the cross. And yet he was committing all this to the Lord. He said, Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. If this cup can pass from me, this cup of suffering, Lord, if there's another way, but, but above all, let your will be done. He committed his life to the Lord. This is a level of commitment of humility that we are learning and we are growing into. That we are learning to have a deep dependence upon God. Even when circumstances don't go our way. Even when people are not popular with how we live our lifestyle. But we are depending on God. Christ was so dependent even to the point of death. Even death on the cross. He committed his life into the hands of God. Even as he lived here on this earth. And so therefore, since he is our Lord and Master, he gave us the example, we need to also be willing to grow in our humility before God. A lot of times we play that humble game, oh, I'm, I'm humble, or you know, in front of others, but are we really humble? Sometimes we play that game that we want to show humility to others by, by carrying ourselves in a certain way, uh, hoping that others would notice, oh, he's a humble guy, oh, She's a humble sister. And yet then our pride feels good about ourselves. Oh, yes, I, I, yes, I, yes, praise God, praise God, I am. No, what even goes even beyond that? There will be circumstances, there will be difficulties where we have to depend on God, where we will be humiliated even in the eyes of family, friends, uh, that you know they may think less of us, but yet we have a joy of knowing that we are being humble in the eyes of God. Knowing that, Lord, I am depending on you to take me through this circumstance, this situation. Even if, it, even if it hurts my pride, which is the biggest one, at least from my point of view, the biggest thing that I wrestle with is my pride. You know, that I, can't, that I lose control. A lot of times we like to have control over things. When things is not in our control, you know, we get into our feelings. These are the moments where we are learning to trust in God, learning to trust in his word. A lot of times he put us in these situations so that we can trust in him. He put us in these situations so that we can learn to pray. He put us in these situations so that we can ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking, because he wants us to be conformed to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what helps me, and I believe it would help you to keep things in perspective. Whenever we are in our feelings, and we got going through all levels of emotions and sometimes we're disappointed in what God is doing. We also got to take a step back and say, OK, Lord, I am growing in you in this area of dependence upon you. We say that we trust in the Lord and we do. But then there are different layers, different progressions as we are trusting in the Lord. So that's the first thing. And that's the only uh, we need to have a transformed mind, Lord, uh, transformed mind to be like Christ, just as Christ was humble to the ultimate point of even giving his life for lost humanity. We need to grow in having a transformed mind. Romans teaches us that we should have a transformed mind and, uh, and therefore we should be willing to go this path. Number two here, we need to have a transformed mannerism. And one of the aspects I'll, I'll talk about today is we must learn how to serve one another as Christ served us. The disciples serving heart reflects Christ who came not to be served, but to serve and is give his life as a ransom for many, Matthew 20, 28. As Isaiah prophesied, Jesus came into this world as the servant who would suffer and die for our redemption. The word ransom means the price paid for release of those in bondage. Jesus gave his life to release us from sin and death. Jesus modeled serving when he washed the disciples' feet. Back in that culture, usually a servant or the person with the lowest social status, could be a child, the lowest social status, 
washes the feet of guests or visitors. But Jesus, in his role of Lord and teacher, washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper as an example to them, John 13, 14, and 15. We serve God even when it costs us the loss of man's approval, honor, power, prestige, pleasure, and even our lives. We understand the bigger picture. One day we want to hear God say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. That should be one of the things that reminds you, encourages you to keep on going when things are very difficult in his life. That God wants to reward us for being faithful servants of him. Of him. We live in a society where academic achievements, economic prosperity, athletic championships, political power, and popularity measures greatness. These standards are irrelevant in God's eyes. And God declares greatness based on humble and loving service to one another and trusting him for the results. The way up is to go down and the road to high honor is by the low pathway of humility. If you look at the letters in the word serve, S-E-R-V-E, -E, you can briefly draw out several lessons from that word going through each letter. The S in serve means to serve sacrificially. Many of you may be familiar with the Macedonian church who gave out of their poverty, out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. They gave out of their poverty in order to help the Jerusalem church who was going through a difficult time. Or the E in serve, we need to encourage others. You may learn from the lessons of Barnabas in the, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. Barnabas sold his land and gave the proceeds to those that were in need. Barnabas also, he provided a character reference for Saul of Tarsus. Uh, Barnabas also encouraged the new Gentile believers in the church of Antioch. And Paul also, uh, I mean, Barnabas also mentored others like John Mark. These are ways that we can serve one another, examples of ways we can serve. So that's the S and the E. The R in the word serve means the lesson that I could draw from that is that we respond to the needs of others. We respond to the needs of others. The classic example is the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan had a compassionate heart, a helping hand, and unlimited resources and concern. He gave of his personal comfort and, re and generous amounts of time and convenience and time and resources to help the battered man in the parable of the Good Samaritan. The, uh, the V in the word serve, Nehemiah, uh, had a vision to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. After Ezra came back, Ezra, after Ezra came earlier and they rebuilt the temple from uh, when they were in exile, Ezra came back first, he rebuilt the temple. But then the walls around Jerusalem were not fixed, they were still broken. And so Nehemiah came with a vision to rebuild the walls. And even as he was rebuilding the walls, he had uh, Sanballat and Tobias. He had critics saying, come down. Oh, that wall is not going to last and all that. He, he said, I can't come down. I'm doing a good work. I'm doing God's hand is upon me. So we need to have a vision in view in serving. Because many times when we're serving, if we don't have the right motive, it is so easy to be discouraged. Uh, but yet we need to have a vision that God's favor is upon me as I serve. Whether I see the results that I want, or not, that's irrelevant, because we have to learn to leave the results up to God. In the E, in the word serve, we learn that we need to serve excellently. Uh, we are reminded of the story of Daniel, who was, who was a, a servant in, the, uh, uh, in, 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 in captivity. <clears throat> and uh, he was a high-ranking uh, servant. Uh, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the safe traps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And so, uh, you know, the king wanted to set Daniel up in a high place, but Daniel also had his critics. There were men that said, uh, we can't find nothing about his work. The only thing we can do is try to discredit him against his God. It says in Daniel chapter 6, verse, verse 5, 
Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And you may be familiar with the story how they got the king to sign a decree that put Daniel in a bind. That, but you know, the Lord brought Daniel out of the lion's den. But the point here is Daniel served excellently. Even though he was a slave, a servant in a foreign country, he was in exile, he still knew that God was with him. So this is how uh, we should have some of these same attributes as we are all growing in the grace of God. Don't beat yourself up because you're not where you want to be. Just recognize the fact I'm still growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he is leading me and guiding me. And we will reach that point of maturity that we all desire. Trans we need to talk about spiritual discipline, the methods. Many of us, as we became Christians, okay, we gave our lives to the Lord, we, we, we repented, we gave our lives to the Lord, and it's so important that we have a solid foundation in growing in God. That is so important. It's, not, uh, it's, 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 it's foolish like when a baby comes home from the hospital, a newborn baby, the parents would just put the baby in the kitchen and say, Go feed yourself. Go clean yourself. Go, you know, that's foolish. And sometimes we treat new believers the same way. Someone gets saved uh, in our church, and we just assume that they will catch on. We, many of us assume, oh, they'll catch on. Uh, you know, they, they, they know that they need to pray. They know that they need to fast. They know they need to read the Bible. They know they need to memorize scripture. They know we are living now in a generation where people don't know these things. I grew up in the, uh, I was born in the, you know, mid 50s. I was born in 1953, you know, in, you know, in 50s and 60s in the community that I was in. My, you know, many of us went to church. I went to Sunday school. So many of these, even though I was not Christian until I was an adult, but we heard these things. We knew what needed to be done. But nowadays, since the 60s, generation after generation, there are people that don't know God. They don't know the Ten Commandments. They don't know anything about prayer and fasting and going to church. And as far as, as the way that we know it is knowing God. Many people go to church for other reasons, for social reasons or for entertainment. And so sometimes we can't assume that because someone gave their life to the Lord, your co-worker, your neighbor, or someone that comes through these doors, that they automatically know what to do. We have to learn to take people by the hand and help them to grow in God. And you will find out that as you help others to grow, you yourself will grow. It's just like many of you as parents, you know that as a parent, if, if you have children, uh, you know, as you teach them, you know that you also uh, have to be accountable to them. Like when I teach my son how to be a man and, and how to do things, he's also looking at me as his father. So I can't teach him one thing. You know, what's ridiculous when I was growing up, you know, we had these old guys in the neighborhood. They'd be they'd be sitting there smoking away, puffing away. <laughs> And then they'll say, hey, young blood, don't be smoking, man. Don't be smoking. And here they are puffing away. It gave mixed messages. They hear smoking and drinking and doing stuff. And yet they'll say, hey, young blood, hey, young guy, hey, don't be like me. Don't do this. But, you know, and, and, and same thing when in, in my home, when I'm, when I'm working with my children, my adult children and so forth. I mean, I encourage them to pray. I encourage them to do the things of God. But they must see me do it as well. So discipling others also puts a spotlight on myself because I mean, I'm not saying I have to live perfect. You know, you know, God knows my wife knows I'm not I'm not blameless in everything. But as I grow in the Lord, I am acutely aware that as I teach others what they should be doing, I myself must also grow. Discipleship is a two way street. As I'm helping others, others are helping you. Many of you have, you know, maybe trained somebody on your job to do a specific task. Something that maybe even you yourself had done for many years. A new person will come on the job and see something different. And then you have to say, wow, I like your idea. That is a much better way of doing things. I've learned something from you. Just as I'm teaching you, you are teaching me. We must have this attitude as part of the body of Christ that we are learning when we, uh, to help one another. And these are the things that we must put in practice if we want to grow in God. Some of the most common things is, you know, a devotional Bible reading, prayer, fasting, times of solitude, just talking and talking to God, listening to God. Because uh, that's different than prayer. 
prayer is, you know, prayer, you actually talking to God, having a conversation. Solitude is when you're just quieting yourself and having a focused time, being in the presence of God and ministering to God in, in that way, having God speak to you uh, in that way. Not necessarily talking to God, but as much as Lord, just speak to me. I'm the, I remove all my distractions. I'm in a quiet place. There are times of service, there are times of worship. All these things we must put into our lives and we must learn to be consistent if we want to grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, many of us, depending on our church background, we already know these things. Uh, and we know that we should be praying and fasting and serving and, and you know, various other disciplines. There's so many uh, spiritual disciplines. But one thing that all of us need to be acutely aware of as we grow in the Lord, as we have a desire to grow in the Lord, we must learn to budget our time. We must learn to have good time management. What do I mean by that? If faithfully practiced, one, one the discipline elevates all the other disciplines, and it is the discipline of time management. Time management is crucial to the disciples' commitment in pursuing godliness. Author Donald Whitley says this, godliness is the result of a biblically disciplined spiritual life. But at the heart of a disciplined spiritual life is the disciplined use of time. Time is a limited and precious quantity available to be used purposefully. The psalmist in Psalm 90, 12 says this, teach us Lord to, remember, to number our days that we may get a heart of worship. Time management. How much time do you spend reading the word? How much time do you spend praying? How much time do you be, uh, you are blessing the others? Your time tells you your level of commitment. Are you willing to take, uh, spend a half an hour more doing something for the Lord and a half an hour less on the TV or on the internet or on the website? We all have choices. And we all prioritize, just like many of you prioritize your money, your budget. You say, well, I got a certain amount of money. I got to, you know, give my offering to the church. Uh, you know, that's what I believe first. But then, you know, you decide to give. If you decide to give, you know, you say, I got rent to pay. I got utilities. I got a car note, this, that, you know, whatever. Our time should be the same way. We need to make time to serve God. We need to make, we need to make time to grow in the grace of God. And it doesn't mean you have to do it all by yourself. Some things are done with others, like studying the Bible together, praying together, serving together, witnessing together. So don't always feel like I have to do everything by myself. We lose that context, in the, especially in the New Testament letters. When Paul is writing to the church, he's saying, you all, as we, as we from the South would say, you all, everybody should be doing this together. Not just you as an individual, but you all. And that, and that helps when you do things with, with someone else. I mean, I, I, I heard the deacon talk about, you know, he, he was cutting grass. And the same thing, when I cut grass in my house, I now taught my son how to cut grass. It makes a difference when you have two people cutting grass. You know, I, I do the, the, you know, the weed whack and I let him use the lawnmower. It seems like we, we get so much more done in less of time. It's the same thing even in ministry. Don't always feel like you have to do everything by yourself. Even though sometimes it's discouraging to find someone, but have the mindset that I need to get somebody. Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. So more and more we should be doing things together and not just feel like it's just me, myself and I. So budget your time. It is so important, depending on your seriousness, how serious you are. Remember when you was dating your husband or, or your wife. You made time for them if you really wanted to spend time with them. You made time for those on job. You know, you know what's interesting? We all know people who are habitually late. They're always late. But then you notice that they're always on time when it comes for their job. They always punch in on time. But they're late for everything else. Why? What's important? It's money for them at that point. <laughs> You know, so that is so amazing. They're late for everything else. Oh, let's go to this, uh, you know, this, this wedding. You're waiting for them an hour and a half. But yet that same person, when it's time for them to be at work, to punch their clock at 9 o'clock, they are there. Why? That's their priority. And we all have that choice. We all have to recognize 
we have choices. We can't keep blaming others for not doing what we need to do. Yes, we are tempted to take a nap when we should be doing something. Yes, we are tempted to do other things. Yes, sometimes it's hard to say no to certain things. You know, you got family members or friends that want you to do certain things, and you're so used to saying yes, but you need sometimes to say, no, uh, I am not available. And a lot of times, you don't always have to give a reason to say I'm not available. I have another commitment because you know God wants you to spend time doing something else. We can't blame mothers for that, even though we are influenced by our family and friends to a certain degree. But yet we have to grow up to a point and say, Lord, I have to resist this, re this request. They want me to do this, but Lord, I know I need to be spending time over here. We have to learn to budget our time because that is a reflection of how committed you are in Christ. Especially, you know, like, like in my case, I have three, well, I only have one son at home, but you know, my children, I'm always conscious of how I live before them. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, and they and like, like my son gave this testimony at the men's meeting one time, he's 28, and he gave this testimony, and he surprised me, he told the men at the meeting, he said, I'm a Christian because my father's one. He said, I've seen how he lived his life. And, and, and that's why I, I became a Christian. And I mean, that just blessed me. I didn't expect them to say that. But I'm just saying, it just means a lot when you take the time to be faithful and to budget your time before God. Again, leave the results up to him. I know you and I, we have preconceived ideas of how we believe God is going to move and how God is going to answer. We all have that. But yet at the same time, when things are disappointing as far as what we desire, our faith still must be in God. Because we have to believe God has something better than what I or we have expected. Last but not least, so that's the part of spiritual discipline. And there are many spiritual disciplines uh, of how to grow in the Lord. But it's so important that we can't have an attitude that oh, now that I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and uh, I'm just going to sit back and let God do everything. Oh, no, God did, it's not set out that way in Scripture. He says, put away lying. He said, forgive as I have forgiven you. He said, do good, especially to those of the household of faith. He gives us instructions. And we are obligated as children of God to be obedient. That's how our lives become transformed, by being obedient. That's how we grow in the things of God. And this is how he's conforming us into his image. Again, we are learning to be less selfish and more dependent upon God. And those of us that have been married, we know that that's part of being married. If you, have a, if you have a healthy marriage, you know that a lot of your selfishness that I know at least when I entered into marriage has decreased. I still have my selfish moments, but a lot of it has decreased because now I'm looking out for my, for my wife and she's looking out for me and, and I'm looking out for my kids and they're looking out for me. But I'm just saying this is all part of the progress, all part of the growth. And again, don't beat yourself up over stuff. Just say, all right, I'm growing in this area. I'm growing in this area. And that's the, that's the best attitude to have with others. Even, even when family and friends try to poke holes at your walk, just say, hey, what you said may be true, but yet I'm still growing in God. You, we don't have to prove anything except being faithful to him. Last but not least is, oh, that picture of the, of the clock and that person supposed to be like you put a balance your balance your time. That's what I guess that's, I saw that image. What is our mission in life as a Christian? Many of us are familiar with the Great Commission of, of Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, "All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations." baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I read this quote from Oswald Chamber from his devotional My Utmost for His Highest. He says this, the key to the missionary's work is the authority of Jesus Christ not the needs of the lost. He does not say that the lost will never be saved if we do not go. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go based on the revealed truth of my sovereignty, teaching and preaching out of your living experience of me, unquote. 
So we are doing this because we are ministering from the presence of the Lord. Again, don't see yourself only as this is something I have to do. See this as something that we have to do as the body of Christ. And we as a body of Christ, you are not limited to this Haverhill congregation. Many of you have uh, co-workers that are saved or other family members that are saved or other connections with other Christians. It doesn't matter where the connection is in the body of Christ as long as the body of Christ. I know some people have an elitist thought of, you know, it's only me and my church. I can't fellowship with others. I, 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 I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a proponent of that line of thinking. I'm thinking anytime me and a, some brother in, in the body of Christ, uh, if we can agree on the things of God, we can work together. How can the local church prioritize the mission of making disciples? The local church must make missions and making disciples a compelling concern for all ages. Mission lessons are taught from the Old and New Testament, starting in Sunday school. Sermons are integrated with mission themes. Corporate prayer times must include a global mission focus. I'll stop there. Many times some local congregations are not missionary focused because all they pray about is themselves, uh, about their needs. You know, so-and-so got a bunion on her toe and whatever the case may be. And, and there's, there is a place for that. But there's also a place to also pray for outside the four walls. It's just like when you go to the YMCA and they have a swimming pool and you look on their schedule, they have the pool designated for certain times for those who swim very well and those who doesn't swim very well and, and those in between. It's the same way when we have our church prayer meetings. We need to have all types of prayers, prayers for, the, for, prayers for inward and prayers for outward. So we just can't have an unbalanced meal, like always eating sweets all the time. No, we have to have a balanced meal, uh, like eating you know, the, the different dietary uh, vitamins and, and, and uh, healthy options. We need to do the same thing in, in corporate prayer. We need to pray for the leaders. We need to pray for each other, pray for each other's needs. Then we need to pray for our neighborhood, pray for our community, pray for the booth. There is a time and place for everything. Again, that goes back to budgeting your time. It goes back to budgeting your time and have a balanced view of, of prayer, especially when you're praying with others. Um, small group ministries must have a mission focus as well. The church can reach out to a different ethnic group that lives in the church's neighborhood. Teen, youth, and college age ministries must have a global mission concern. The church connects with international students and families attending local schools and colleges. Financial support for missions must start in Sunday school and be emphasized within the congregation. The importance of global missions must be strongly reflected in the church budget, not just at selected times. In conclusion, a healthy disciple is transformed daily by the Holy Spirit to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. The disciple is transformed in their mind, their mannerism, their method of spiritual discipline and mission. Let us continue to grow in God's grace in all these areas. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, the presence of your word, the power of your word. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we have receptive hearts, that the Holy Spirit will plant within us those truths that you wanted us to know that you wanted us to meditate in the, in the uh, hours and the days ahead. Father, I pray for this congregation, as I had prayed earlier, they're going through another season of transitioning, of senior leadership, and Lord, there may be different emotions, but Father, we pray in Lord that you would guide this church even, even through this season. And Lord, that you would raise up the leader and leaders that they need to go through. But Lord, even in the midst of this, Lord, we are declaring our trust is in you. Father, I pray that every need of the church will continually be met, that they'll be able to take care of all their financial obligations, that they'll still be able to minister to this community until the new pastor arrives. Lord, I pray for the spirit of encouragement. I pray for the spirit of peace in the spirit of your love, that even in despite, Lord God, of not having a senior pastor, 
in spite of going through this period, Lord, of having different speakers every week and not having a level of continuity or not having a level of, of consistency in certain areas, Father, I pray for them that they will sense your spirit and your presence, that they will have a deep humility, a deep dependence upon you, that they may not always have to explain everything to family, friends, and loved ones, but all they can say is that we trust in you. Continue, Lord God, to give this congregation health and strength to be able to do all that you called them to do. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, once again for this opportunity to break the bread of life with them. In Jesus' name, amen.